Alright. Just wait for a couple people to show up. Alright, here we go. Thank you all for tuning in to Ask an Athlete Ambassador Live. My name is Lauren Lubin April. I am the Senior Director of Community Impact at the Women's Sports Foundation and your host. You know, sports may be on pause, but here at the Women's Sports Foundation, we keep playing. And that is why each week I will be talking to some of the greatest female athletes in the world and featuring some of our amazing WSF community partners who have pre-prepared questions for our amazing athlete ambassadors. Today, I am so excited to welcome back a very special guest who I like to refer to as a firecracker, both on and off the field. She is a World Cup champion, a three-time Olympic gold medalist, amazing, a two-time NCAA national champion with the University of North Carolina, now is also a coach for the University of North Carolina, is an international sports commentator, a household name, and honestly, probably one of her biggest and greatest achievements, a soon-to-be mom-to-be. Give it up, everybody. We are about to spend the next minutes with Heather O'Reilly. I'm just going to get Heather really quickly. We are back. I'm back in the throwback jersey for you. Nice. I almost Did you sleep a, in it? I almost drew in a fourth star, but I didn't want to ruin it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so for everybody watching at home, thank you for tuning in again. We had a little bit of a technical difficulty yesterday, but listen, champions adjust. We are back. It is Friday, so we're going to have some fun. Yeah. Okay. A little adversity never slowed us down. Never. If there were, if we never overcame adversity, we'd get nowhere. Um, before we get started, are you sitting in front of a picture of your own self? Sure am. Sure am. You, um, this was a create? gift. This was a gift that somebody painted for me, a good friend, uh, when I, I think had my final game with the U.S. team. And you know what? I think it was dope. So yeah, I have a painting of myself in my workout in my workout area. That is if, so cool. if you if you or some of the viewers are going to judge me on that, then like maybe you know what? Maybe I don't want to be your friend. So well, Heather, I'm sitting in front of a clock that's been broken for three years, and it's <laughs> and it's it said eight forty five for three and a half years. So if you want to judge me on that, go for it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so yesterday, in our short amount of time, we actually covered a, a lot of ground. So I'm going to do a quick recap, and then we're going to move forward. Ready? Wait. First of all, you are just a couple months away from having your first baby. Congratulations. How are Thank you doing? You. How are you doing? Um, I'm doing well. I mean, clearly, it's not like, you know, ideal to be pregnant in a pandemic. But beside that, um, things are great, and I did not really have much symptoms and stuff like that. I feel like I've been able to stay pretty much the same me. I just look like I have a bowling ball in my shirt. Um, but beside that, I'm doing fine, and um, hopefully the next couple of months, I'm about nine weeks away, so hopefully the next couple of months, um, the world continues to improve, and we start to... Um, you know, get back a little bit to normalcy because, yeah, it would be nice for me to have normal doctor's appointments and be able to have the grandparents come see the baby, all that kind of thing. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I realize that there's huge things going on in the world um, and people are getting very sick. So I, I, I don't want my, you know, my request to, to, to seem a little bit selfish, but um, that is kind of the, the truth of it right now. But things are okay. Thanks for asking. 
Well, I'm happy you're doing well, and it is. It is unprecedented times, and I think the fact that, like you said, not having the ability to connect with family how we would want to connect with family or even people in our normal life, I think that's what makes moments like these taking time out of our day to connect with, with one another. And I see so many of your fans tuning in, you know, minute by minute to um, have an opportunity to connect during times when this is the most important thing. Um, so I'm happy you're doing well. And um, I'm happy that we're able to, to take a couple minutes to inspire others during all of this. So I, I'm going to go back to our recap yesterday. You also have a very uh, mischievous and tomboy puppy named uh, Frankie. <laughs> it's very cute. Thank you, you were introduced to the Women's Sports Foundation through teammate Julie Foudy, who is also a past president of the Women's Sports Foundation. And I would also have to say a little bit of a troublemaker, but, you know. She, she, she like Frankie, is very mischievous. Very Best mischievous. Like to sit still. Yeah. Is that like a soccer thing? I feel like the whole soccer team is a little mischievous. Am I wrong? No, you're not wrong. We're like work hard, play hard kind of people, I think. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're, you're all like, you all have a certain personality type and it's fun. I think that's why you electrify the whole world. I think that you're onto something there. Yeah, we like to compete um, and win. But I think that we bizarrely don't take ourselves too seriously in other components of our lives. Yeah. Um, maybe because we take our, our craft so seriously and like winning so seriously and like we don't have any energy left of other seriousness. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's one, uh, that's one theory behind it. That's a good theory. Well, my, I remember when I was growing up and my dad was coaching me with basketball, he would say only focus between the four lines, you know, the four perimeters. Yeah. I feel like that's so much what soccer is when you're just totally locked in. It's like you are locked in within those parameters. And then when it's over, it is just the opposite. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think that allowed um, the culture of like the U S national team um, to be so special because we like really get after it. I'm sure that a lot of teams say the same thing, but we really get after it at training in terms of like competitiveness, keeping a score. There's been some like pretty naughty tackles out, out there on the training pitch. Kelly O'Hara has been guilty of a few, um, some, you know, I want to say banter, but it was more like yelling at each other. Like just truthfully it was about what a score was or like if the ball went over the line. But then by the time, like, maybe a, an hour or two after practice when we were all, like, having dinner together or whatever, we're able to, to laugh about it. So we all know that we're, like, kind of weirdos. Um, but we, appreciate, <laughs> we appreciate each other's, like, um, you know, weird tendencies. And that's what makes, uh, I think, our, that team so special. Absolutely. I mean, it is notable from just being a spectator and a fan through, and I'd have to say throughout the course of many iterations of the of the national team that there's just amazing camaraderie that exists between all your players. And you can just see it. You see it in the way you interact with one another. You see it in the way you play. And it's infectious. It's just amazing. It's, I think it's not only your quality of play, but the way in which you all care for each other that is just you know so special it's it's why I'm wearing this <laughs> yeah I mean and, and, and talking about Julie Foudy like she was a pioneer of that um, I think that they took a lot of care in the early days of the national team to to really distinguish their DNA uh, as a program and what it meant and of course it's evolved through the years with you know younger players coming through or social media and more attention more eyeballs like Certainly, it's not, like, the same as the team was, like, 25 years ago. But I think that a lot of the qualities that they instilled early on of kind of work hard, play hard, like, compete like hell. Like, don't be embarrassed to be great and embarrassed to want to have big dreams. Like, every tournament we go into, we pretty much say win or bust. Like, that's, mm. you know, anything beside winning gold is a, a severe disappointment for us. And I don't think a lot of other countries or a lot of teams like to actually say that out loud because yeah. it leaves you very exposed. It leaves you very um, open, I think, to disappointment because these tournaments are hard. Um, so a lot of other teams, you'll hear their responses be like, oh, you know, we progressed 
more than we did last tournament or we felt like we got better as a team and we played good football, all these things. And we're just like, did we win it or not? Did we win yeah. it or not? And yeah. Um, and yeah, and we care about each other along the way, you know, I think compared to like an office environment, a team locker room or dressing room is certainly like more intimate than, than a lot of those arenas, you know, you kind of, I think sport brings out like these crazy highs and lows yes. of your emotion, um, because it's such a passion of yours, right? It's like, we love the game. And, and I think that you're like, you're very um, vulnerable, I think. And so you see each other in these like highs and lows of your career um and then also going through that is your personal life as well you know we see each other go through relationships or buying their first home or getting married you know there's been so many weddings that we've been able to like support each other at um and things like that and, and no doubt like some of them are your best friends and some of them are like your teammates and yeah. that's fine as well um as long as like the underlying fabric uh is respect um you know you don't have to be best friends with everybody but you do have to have an enormous amount of respect for people's contributions and gifts and differences um and if you do that i think that you're on your way to being a good team i hope all of our viewers at home were taking a lot of notes because you just summed up you know the beauty of playing team sports and and being with your teammates and i i know that i've been retired from sports for some time now I still refer to my teammates as teammates and we haven't played a game together in like a decade. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> I'm they're, sure they're that I'll be the same forever. Your teammates. So we have a lot of viewers who are tuning in. I see Argentina people from all over the world. So I'm going to do a quick little synopsis of, of what to expect here. So we're already underway. I'm going to ask you a couple more, just fun, sport based, relevant questions. We actually have some pre-prepared questions from two amazing WSF community partners um, that we will feature later, a little bit later. And I'll also open to view, uh, questions from viewers. So viewers at home, if you're watching, start asking questions now. We have our WSF team who is compiling questions. Get them in. We'll try to get to them. And at last, I am going to challenge you to your favorite in-home fitness activity, okay? And I'm wearing a very special fitness outfit, so get excited for that, everybody, okay? I can't, I can't wait. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's great. It, all, the people who know me at home are going to get a big kick out of it, too. So, um, okay. So, first of all, I just, I, I have to start out by saying the World Cup. Oh, my gosh. And I have, I absolutely loved watching you pre and post game. I would tune in and set my DVR early prior yes. to just to catch the pre and post game. First of all, you're, you're amazing. You're hilarious. And you, you know, you're so insightful, but it was just so great to see you in that position. What was it like for you to experience the world cup like that? Yeah, it was cool. I mean, uh, clearly it was a different role. I say that this was my fourth World Cup that I was part, in, part of, like four times, uh, four times there, but three times as a player and one time on this side of the line as an, as an analyst for Fox. Um, so clearly as an athlete, like you dream of being out in the field, right? But the next best thing is to be able to talk about the people out on the field and what they should have been doing better. Um, <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, I really enjoyed it because I think that I, uh, it allowed me to kind of see the World Cup um, from a more like holistic view. Like when you're, when you're an, a player at the World Cup, like it's so serious, especially for us. Like, like I said, yeah. you're like win or bust. So, um, you know, you're in your room, you're taking care of your body, you're taking care of your mind. You know, you're either like, are you in the starting lineup? Are you not? Are you scoring? Are you not? Like, there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, it's very intense. Obviously, it only comes comes around every four years. So uh, you want to be kind of top of your game. Um, so you do everything in, in order to do that. Whereas when you're on the broadcasting side, you get to really kind of enjoy the atmosphere um, in Paris in June. So like that was like not too shabby. Um, I would just like scoot around and bike around in my bathing suit. And it was just like phenomenal existence. <laughs> um, and, you know, you could just watch the games and kind of watch other players. Like when I'm, when I'm a player, I don't, I kind of get like burnt out if I, or in anxious, I guess, if I watch too many games that are going on in the tournament. Some players like to watch like every game on TV. 
um, that's going on when we're not playing, but I kind of just like need time to like step away and like read or do other things. So this was the first tournament that like I was actually like knowing the scores of all the other games, yeah. knowing who was playing well, how they were playing, things like that. Um, and to be honest, I had a blast. I really did. I had so much fun. Um, my coworkers um, at the desk, uh, you know, we had that camaraderie that I think that yep. I was nervous about when, uh, you know, stepping away from the playing aspect. I was nervous that I wouldn't maybe find that again. Um, but, and it is very special and you'll probably never like replicate it exactly. But my camaraderie with my coworkers was was awesome. We had so much fun. And even at the end, uh, right after the US team won or maybe an hour or two after, I was FaceTiming with Kelly O'Hara, who's a good good friend of mine on the team. And uh, she was actually on the bus outside the stadium. So I, I got to kind of see everybody and there's a lot of champagne being flung, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and somebody from Fox was like, saw that I was on the phone with them and it was like, oh man, are you bummed that you're not out with them tonight? Like, are you, because we were a few hours away, we were in Paris and they were in Lyon. Um, so we were in different cities. And I thought about it and I was like, you know what? No, like, that's not my team this tournament. Like, this is my team. And th these are the only people that I want to be with. Um, so I thought that that was really cool that I was able to kind of pivot the way that I sort of saw who was my team um, yeah. for the tournament. And, 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 and again, like, the, the future is, is exciting and it's bright. And I enjoy that. I enjoy that side of it. So we'll see where it takes me. Well, you are an absolute natural. Like I said, just so fun to watch. I enjoyed watching you on the field, but I equally enjoyed you watching, analyzing the game. And did you find yourself, because like you said, you, you were critiquing games probably differently from an, at an analyst point of view. Do you notice that you take some of those critiques and apply them now to your position at UNC as a coach? Is it similar? I think that it's, transition. yeah, I think, yeah, I do. I think that it's cool that I'm now kind of exposing myself to all different sides of the game, like as a player, as a manager, on the broadcast side of things, because it only makes you, I think, uh, better and more insightful to like have these different perspectives from different, um, different areas. But yeah, certainly in terms of uh, you know, in the coach, in terms of like managerial skills and the way that that coaches are like interacting with players on the sideline or their interviews after games and things like that. I think, uh, yeah, you do kind of pick things up with experience. And um, I don't know, I think it was really great for me to kind of uh, like have a bird's eye view of it all, because then when you're in it, uh, you maybe do kind of show some more uh, detail and attention to things. So you just touched upon something that you just, okay, you, you said, because it's true, you have such a unique perspective on, from being a commentator from the media side to now a coach at the NCAA Rings to be playing on the largest, on the largest stage in front of, you know, the entire world. I have a question for you. You don't have to. You don't have to answer it in a pretty little package, and I don't think we'll we'll be able to answer it in this little short time. But you know, coming off of the victory of the national team and this larger cry for equity and equal pay, and then you have things that are happening systemically throughout the throughout women's sports from the pro women's hockey league boycotting the season for more equitable standards to now this landmark deal that was recently passed uh, with the WNBA, CBA. You have such a unique perspective here. Is there a larger movement that is happening in women's sports right now that like cross league? Um, what is your take on all of this from an insider perspective? Um, you know, I would like to think that these times are different, but uh, not to be a pessimist, but I have been involved in the U.S. team for a long time. And I know that this is this is still the same fight that we were fighting like 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, but I will say that I do think that with all the different movements that are kind of happening in sports and out of sports and in Hollywood and things like that, like people are just getting braver and braver to speak up and um, 
to to put their neck out there. And so I think that like years ago, and maybe it was, um, you know, a few voices here and there, you know, the collective is gaining momentum and is gaining um, a stronger voice. And, and things are improving, but like, I think a lot of women are being like, it's snail's pace improvement. Like, this yeah. is like, like, icebergs melting kind of movement and we need like systemic change we need changes in leadership like we need a revolution um yes. in order to um see significant progress or it's going to be the same fight for our kids you know down the road so i think that people are like are gone of the days of feeling like somewhat embarrassed because yes. Yeah, like, I loved being a female soccer player. The fact that I could do it and make a living, like, that was fantastic. And so I never wanted to, like, step out of bounds and say, like, well, hold on a minute. If my contract's like this, why is my exact peer on the men's team different? I was just kind of, like, wanted to be seen grateful and appreciative, which I was. But I maybe didn't um, voice, I think, uh, with, with courage um that things were glaringly uneven and um i think that women are kind of yeah crossing that barrier of being able to to be brave about it and also stick together i think that's that's part of it obviously we need each other we need you know allies on the, on the men's side um who it doesn't directly affect but they have to realize that, yeah it does directly affect you because it affects you know your company um the, the economy the world um, it does affect so much. So I think that people's like blinders are kind of expanding and, yeah. um, and you know, hopefully big, big changes occur. Yeah. It's so true because, um, it is, it does feel like a snail's pace. And if you are to look at it from, you know, take the snapshot and look at the whole camera roll, so to speak, you can't believe that where we were 20 years ago, we're still using the same language and doing the same things but i think the difference is is there's a there is a space to be bolder and braver and step into it because i really think society at large is really catching up and recognizing oh i understand why you know people are fighting for these things and yeah you know with the women's sports foundation we are you know we have work behind the scenes on so many just of these different advocacy and equitable fights um, with leagues, with players' associations uh, throughout the years to really get us to a place to say, for the world at large, to, to recognize what needs to be done. It's time for equity now. You know? Yeah, I think so. We'll keep up the good work on your guys' side. Yeah, likewise. <laughs> so, <laughs> Thank you. enough with equity. Let's, let's get into um, some more... Uh, fun and easy questions here but thank you thank you for lending lending your voice to that um so we actually have a number of community partner questions and i see a lot of people who are starting to ask questions from our viewers at home so i'm just going to jump into that right now great uh so let's get going first i'm going to start with our featured community partners we have two community partners today from our sports for life program which was started in 2014 with ESPNW. Our first community partner is South Bronx United. They are a soccer-based organization in the Bronx who uses soccer for social change, which includes like ac combining academic enrichment, mentoring, and immigration support. And our second community partner feature is Beyond Soccer, and they are based in Lawrence, Massachusetts, and they use soccer to connect youth and teens to new experiences, both on and off the field. So are you ready? Are you ready. ready. Let's questions? roll. All right, let's do this. So your first question comes from Esmeralda. She is a 19-year-old left winger from South Bronx Community Charter School. And her question is, is there a certain diet that you follow while you're training or during soccer season? Hmm. You know what? I, I would think that my, my teammates, um, who I still call teammates, like, like you said, that never dies. Oh. Would, would somewhat laugh at me because like I'm a very fit and fast player and like you know f somewhat like lean and all that kind of stuff uh, but my diet wasn't like off the charts crazy healthy I feel like I ate totally like in range 
Um, and what I mean by in range is like, you know, I didn't like go overboard in any way. I didn't, um, um, you know, I just made sure that I was getting a lot of protein, which I think yes. as an athlete is, is really critical. And one of the things that I improved throughout my years as I got older is, is really kind of the timing of when you're eating. Um, and as long as you eat like reasonable, I, I, I think that the timing of when you eat is actually maybe even more important because yes. right after exercise, you've really broken down a lot of muscles. And so you want to make sure that you have protein immediately right after. And um, when I was younger, I didn't really do that. And I could tell that I was like starting to feel fatigued and things like that because I was working so hard. I mean, I lay myself out there on the field and like run, uh, run a lot and sweat a lot, but I wasn't refueling myself. So I would encourage uh, anybody to have some protein right after they work out, whether it's a shake or yoga or whatever it is, smoothie. Um, that's absolutely critical. And then just like simple things like um, having a good breakfast. Um, yeah. And uh, another thing that was absolutely critical to me was hydration, like I don't know. I just like never really drank that much water um, when so I was just younger. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that it's important to figure out like what you like or like what works for you. Like what, like carrying around a jug of water. That's like, you know, what they do at like the meathead gyms in New Jersey. <laughs> but like, if that works for you, like that's awesome. Um, for me, like my friends would make fun of me because I, I after coming back from Europe, I played it with Arsenal for a year and a half. I came back and would only drink sparkling water. And they're like, oh my gosh, you're such a Euro snob now. And I was like, listen, I have figured out that I love sparkling water. I don't do flat water anymore. And if this is going to keep me hydrated and happy, like, and healthy, this is what I'm going to do. So I think that, yeah, like, it's important to figure out what works for you for hydration. But, like, it is really important. Like, your cells need hydration it's, it's that simple and that will that will help so many things like it literally helps your like brain function yep. your sleeping uh your just like general health your skin um it helps so many things so i'm a big uh, big advocate on hydration so as 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 simple as that sounds it will make a lot of uh improvement thank you i, I think i just learned that i might hydrate like a meathead but that's fine I'm fine with that. Okay, so hydration and, and post workout are and post workout uh, snacks or meals are probably most important right now. Well, and and in general. Okay, so your next question comes from Will Marie, a eighth grade Wolverine team player from Beyond Soccer, and I love this one. What advice would you give to soccer players like me who are entering high school and who want to end up winning medals like you? Huh. Well, loaded question. Um, I think that, like, I, I, I try to simplify, like, life and also soccer. Um, maybe sometimes I should have been, like, more, like, thoughtful and cerebral about my approach. But I always just kind of said, like, work harder than everybody else and have fun. And if, if, the, if you can do those two things in sync... Like, if you actually genuinely believe that working hard is fun, I think that you're going to be in a good position because yeah. a lot of people kind of separate the two and it's like, okay, I, we had gym today, it was, all, it was awful, or like, we had to do these sprints or fitness tests and like, but like, in a sick way, like, I enjoyed that kind of stuff because I enjoyed pushing myself, I enjoyed like the grind, like I enjoyed kind of doing it together with my team and seeing us get better. Um, so I think that I like, I had, uh, yeah, a good relationship with hard work and I remembered to have fun. I mean, I was always kind of goofing off at practice, but in a way that like, just kind of light, lightened the mood more than was a distraction because at the end of the day, it is pretty fun what we get to do. And I think that when we return to soccer um, or return to school, everybody will have a new appreciation for like being together and, you know, doing this amazing sport together. So I'm sure that everybody will have a blast. But um, if you want to win medals, you gotta, you got to outwork everybody. I mean, it, it does not come. Um, I mean, Lionel Messi, I'm sure, outworks everybody. Megan Rapino, I know, worked on her set pieces more than anybody. Tobin Heath worked with the ball more than anybody. Like, 
these aren't just like things that happen. Um, so I, I would say, yeah, nothing, nothing beats like good old simple hard work and, and putting, putting the time in. Absolutely. Well put. Um, this is a great one too. This is from Sadie Farnsworth, who is a mentor and college, mentor coach and college student at Beyond Soccer. And the question is, how has your journey in soccer transformed you as an individual? And how has it impacted your view on yourself, your self-esteem? Um, and what advice would you give young females to stay confident in themselves? Mm. Wonderful question. I think that like, it, it's actually hard for me to separate sport with myself because they've been so intertwined like since I was like a, a kid I can't even imagine like my world without um, team sports but if I had to guess um, I would say that like um, it really helped me like learn how to just really be brave um, mm -hmm. have courage just kind of dive into things Whereas, like, I see people that aren't, like, necessarily that athletic, like, kind of dance around the fringes, where, whereas I think a lot of um, competitive-minded people or, or team, team sports kind of folks are like, let's go. Like, if we fail, like, at least we went for it. And I think that that has been, um, like, a driving feeling in my life that, like, I'm just going to go for it. And um, for the most part, it has worked out for me. Um, let's see, how has it helped my self-esteem? Yeah, I think that like, you know, it builds, uh, it's definitely character building. You have to deal with like things not going your way. Um, obviously adversity, <laughs> adversity. um, I always say that, that scar tissue is stronger than skin. Um, mm -hmm. maybe some doctors would actually kind of come back and say, <laughs> say something different, but I say scar tissue is stronger than skin because, I actually think whether it's an injury or like a, a psychological uh, cut or an emotional challenge or something like that, uh, that you actually come out of it like later on, like actually stronger than you went in. And it's yes. really hard to see like at the time because it, it pretty much sucks, but um, it is it is stronger in, at the end of the day. So yeah, I think you pick up those kinds of things. I picked up meaningful relationships, what it means to be reliable, what it means to be responsible and accountable, because I've always, you know, it's not just me out there, it's like my team. And I think that that has made me like a more um, accountable, like person in my family, in my community and all those kinds of things, because I realize like the power of, of, of a team. So um, yeah, I can't speak highly enough about like team sports and its impact on me as an individual. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm really happy that I had three older brothers that introduced me to, to soccer back in the day. And I was probably out at their games, like in a stroller, um, but I fell in love with soccer at a really young age and it never left me. Oh, that's amazing. I mean, there are endless benefits to sport outside of just winning. And I know for myself, it, it really shaped me into the person I am today. And I, I can attribute everything in my life to just playing sports, including just having so much fun, you know? Um, okay, we have a number of people. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch to just a few more questions from our actual viewers at home because there are so many coming in and then I'm gonna, we want to quickly go to this fitness challenge and everybody who's watching, we're all going to try and keep up with Heather O'Reilly pretty soon. So let's, let's see what we can do. But I saw in the comment that I absolutely love. What's your favorite anecdote from, uh, uh, from Tobin, about Tobin Heat? Mm. Oh, man. There's a, there's a few that I can't share. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so, Tobin, so Tobin and I have been friends for a long time because we both grew up in New Jersey. I'm a few years older than her, but um, we grew up kind of in the same area in New Jersey. And then, well, she likes to say that she followed me because she followed me to UNC, followed me to the national team. We even played um, on a few professional teams together. Um, but Tobin and I are like, we call each other yin and yang because we have like this like love and admiration for each other and total respect and sisterhood. But we are like different people, like, <laughs> different people. So we say that we're yin and yang just because like, like I'm very type A, she's very laid back. I mean, we have a lot of similarities as well, but like just the way that we kind of like approach life and approach um, our football uh, a lot of times was like very... 
um, let's just say like um, you're getting some complimentary, yes. complimentary. Yes. Um, so uh, I think one of my favorite memories with Tobin was uh, at the 2012 Olympics. Um, and actually we spoke about this game yesterday because it was one of my favorite memories of his scoring at Old Trafford, which is Manchester United Stadium to not any non-soccer fans. And it's like a, it's like a, you know, a famous venue. Yeah. Very old and very, um, you know, there's a lot of mystique behind it. And before that match in 2012, we weren't able to train on the pitch, which sometimes you're able to like train on the game field, but because they're trying to keep the field nice, we yeah. um, could only do what they call the walkthrough, which, you know, you would kind of get 15 minutes to like walk around, take pictures, um, get a sense of the stadium at least before you play the next day. So Tobin and I are just kind of goofing around um, at Old Trafford and just sort of like taking it in. It's just the two of us. And then um, Tobin gets down and just like sits on the grass like at midfield and starts doing like snow angels kind of in the, in the grass. And then I sit down and start doing snow angels and like the sun was shining on us and we were just like having this like most incredible like blissful moment. Um, and yeah, I think I can like, that was one of those times like I can kind of like close my eyes and like bring myself back to there of, of just like pure joy and like being with, with a good friend in this incredible place. Um, and then, you know, it's even better knowing that we won there and then we won the gold medal together a few weeks later. So, um, that's maybe it. That's one of my favorite Tobin anecdotes, but also like she doesn't wear shoes a lot. I know that's like a really weird thing to say, but like she's barefoot all the time <laughs> and which is like kind of, um, weird for a soccer player. You think like, okay, you could step on glass. Like, are you, yeah, sure, you, sure, you, you sure you should be like skateboarding barefoot right now? Like we have a game coming up, but that's Tobin, right? Like she is a free spirit. Um, and so I would probably be like more like her, like annoying mom that would, be like Tobin like what are you doing but she has like really um really really improved her professionalism through the years <laughs> that's like one thing that um I'm so she proud of her, her like, she grew up she grew up right before my eyes like this young kid that like never wore shoes and would do snow angels she grew up but she didn't lose that like passion yeah um, she just made some more professional decisions <laughs> like wearing shoes and yes. protecting your feet exactly <laughs> oh i love it. that was a good question those are some those are some uh good stories okay i'm gonna do one more question here from from our live audience this it says you've always been a huge fan of nc what is it that keeps you coming back of north carolina um I think as a teenager, when I was being recruited to UNC, I, I came from New Jersey, and um, I was was basically asked by like a lot of people, like, okay, do you want to go to this place that's already a dynasty, or do you want to go somewhere else to knock off the dynasty and like beat them? And I was like, I want to go to the dynasty. Like, I want to go. <laughs> I want to go where they've been the best, um, and I want to be part of that and yeah. so that was just my opinion back then and so I stepped on campus at the University of North Carolina and like I just fell in love with it like you know when you love a place and you belong somewhere um I just like felt like it was like home um and then from a soccer perspective I had a wonderful time at UNC won two national championships made some amazing friends and um like something kept pulling me back here like I lived, you know, I lived in New York for a couple of years. I lived in Boston. Um, I lived over in London for a year and a half. So, like, I've lived these cool places. Um, but Chapel Hill, North Carolina is, like, just, like, kind of my, like, true north, I guess. And, like, where I always feel is home. And and it's cool because it's, like, it's, it's, it's a, a place that people know. And there's a lot of sports and there's a lot of, it's a wonderful institution and there's a lot of arts and things like that, but it's also a small enough community where like people look out for each other yeah. and um, take care of each other. And I figured out that like, for me, like community is everything. Like I love New York city, but like, I think that if I like died in my apartment, like my neighbor wouldn't have even known or cared. <laughs> they probably would have asked me like if they could have, have that unit um, after my body got out of there. Um, hey. 
I'm in New York right now. We take care of each other. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I guess, I, yeah, you're right. I mean, that's the silver lining of, like, when, like, crises happen. Like, people have to like, open their eyes and, and lend a hand and take care of each other. But in my, in my um, experience, I think that, like, maybe a smaller town or smaller community um, was, is just, like, what I need. Um, yeah. And yeah, I think that that's what keeps calling me back. And I met my husband here. He played on the lacrosse team, and so we both have like mega great memories. So yeah. we're kind of like those like Tar Heel freak people that have like way too much Carolina blue like everywhere. Yeah. Well, North Carolina is your true North Carolina. There you go. Nice. <laughs> okay, Heather. Thank you for answering. All of my questions, viewers' questions, our community partner questions. So our last stop in this train ride that we're on together is the Finish Challenge. So viewers at home, you are able to participate live with me and Heather right now. And if you want to submit your videos, use the hashtag WSF Ambassador. We are all going to partake in Heather's favorite in-home fitness challenge. And I just hope I can keep up. But more importantly, I'm going to move to four steps to my workout area, which is also my living room area, which is also my dining room area. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm just going to you know, reveal the rest of my outfit, which is a full-blown stocker. I'm ready for you. I've got uh, shin guards on. No. Oh, oh dear. It, it was my it was my shin guards that it got. It was too much. All right. So what are we doing, Heather? Okay. Well, um, as you know, I'm seven months pregnant, so my workouts aren't like my normal beast mode. Usually, I would have you on the treadmill running like intervals at a crazy yeah. incline. But lucky for you, I can't do that right now. Um, okay. So instead. We're just going to do lunges because that's like evidently good for pregnant ladies to do. Okay. Um, yeah. So we're going to do six lunges on each leg uh, times three sets. So go ahead, put your left foot in front of your right. Everybody now. Yeah, lunge. Yeah, l yeah, there it is. And just give me six. You don't have to bring your foot back. Just down six times. So my six my feet. Feet. Yeah, there it is. Yes. Yes. All right. Yes. Four, five, six. Now I'm switching it? Yes, yeah, switch it, switch it. Okay. Oh, wait, can we just get this really quickly? Nice. Oh, thank you. I told you, we didn't, we didn't know we were teammates. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, now what? Well, you would do that three sets. Did you feel a little bit of burn towards the oh, end? Yeah, or was like, that easy peasy for you? I felt a burn. Okay, good. Yeah, three sets. Okay. So we're going to do it again. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six. And one more time. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, oh, five, six. I'm definitely feeling this in my quads right now. Nice. Good. Okay. Well, you know what? Just that simple quad burn for a few minutes. That's all you got to do sometimes to get the heart rate Keep going. Keep doing it. Keep squatting. <laughs> Keep squatting. Evidently, it's going to help pay off, get this, like, baby out of my body. We'll see. Well, Heather... Please keep yourself safe. Please keep yourself healthy. We're so excited that we, I know we'll all be following when you welcome that beautiful little, little guy into the world. And thank you so much for your time today, for inspiring so many people, and for joining us on a Friday. We appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Great questions, Lauren, and great questions, everybody out there. I hope that, like, this provided, like, at least 30 minutes of um, – I don't know, distraction, humor, education, something. Um, and uh, just best wishes to everybody. Stay healthy and stay happy. And, and uh, thanks for tuning in. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Heather. You're the best. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.